And we're live. Welcome to Music Matters 2020. I'm your host, Jason Tram. Thank you so much for joining us for our unique podcast community where we delve into the issues and challenges in 2020 as seen through the eyes of distinguished colleagues. Remember to subscribe to us on YouTube and hit that bell for the most up-to-date information on upcoming guests and topics. We have a wonderful guest today. We have Kevin Boziger from Nebraska, a wonderful composer and a, a wonderful person. We're glad that he can join us. Um, remember to uh, that you, you can chat in questions, hit that chat button, and you can join in the conversation. We'd love to have our audience join the conversation. We exist to serve the, the musical community, and um, the more of you that join us, the better. And to join that conversation, it just adds more richness. I've been in the music business for 25 years as a conductor and music director, also as a, a music professor and public school music teacher, as um, a church musician. I've worn many hats, as all musicians do these days especially. And in all of my travels, it's my conversations with colleagues that have informed so much about um, and really added so much joy to my life. And when the COVID uh, pandemic hit, all the, co the concerts were canceled and all the guest conducting engagements. And it's been the conversations with these colleagues that have really taught me so much. Innovation, um, um, th thriving under such unique circumstances. It's amazing to see what colleagues are doing. So one of our, our guests today, Kevin Boziger, joins us. He's a very a pu extremely well-published composer and a uh, great musical mind. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Jason. It's great to be here today. So what's new in Nebraska? Well, it's about the same as it is everywhere, although I, I do think the last time that I checked, we were kind of one of the states that's up there a little bit on our cases in COVID. So... Uh, we're kind of hunkering down a little bit, but things are about the same as they are where in a lot of places in the country. So yeah, it's such a challenge. Here. We just saw a spike in cases here in Rockland County, which is in suburban New York City, and we're hope that uh, things start to calm down. We're none of no, nobody knows if it's a flu type of a like a fall seasonal mm -hmm. thing, or it's it's going to be a interesting fall for sure. Yeah, for sure. It just isn't the same as it's ever been before, and you know that's been kind of the mantra for the year is is that we've got to regroup and rethink and be flexible and readjust so we've been doing a lot of that i know we spoke in the in the pre-show we were just saying that that pivot is the official word of 2020 <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a great way to describe it so kevin i haven't seen you in a few years i, I think it was 2017 was that video that played in the intro uh, at ocean grove when you came and you conducted on the choir festival and it was uh people are still talking about that performance your energy and your <laughs> life and that that piece um we all still hum it it's just it's still in the ears one of those pieces that just gets in the head and will not leave so, so thank you so much for joining us today tell us about your journey as an artist well, gosh, you know, it, it's just been kind of interesting. I've been in this doing music now for almost 30 years. So I've been doing a lot of, like you were talking about before when you were doing the introduction, you know, musicians were used to doing a little bit of everything. We conduct, we, we accompany, we sing, we do kind of what we need to to make a living at it. Um, but my family, the background, I come from a very musical family. In fact, my grandmother is the one who taught me piano lessons from the very beginning and was the only piano teacher I had until I went to college. So um, she was a church musician, taught piano, directed church choirs for all of her career and everything. Um, so that's really kind of where it started. But interestingly enough, uh, I did a lot of music things in high school, but that wasn't where my first path was headed when I got out of high school heading to college. I wasn't really sure what to do. So it took Took me a little bit to bobble around for a couple of years and then finally anchor in and decide that music was probably where my passion was. Um, and so then I did my undergraduate degree at Nebraska Wesleyan here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and did music education. So that was kind of my start and did a little bit of writing and composing there. Is That would be the first time that I really started to do that. So I wasn't composing at an early age or anything, but did a little bit of it then. Um, and then I always felt like I... I would be in full-time ministry at some point. Wasn't sure when that would happen. Didn't know if that would happen right away, you know, coming out of college. And I really wanted to teach. So I taught for a year and a church position opened up for a youth and music minister at actually the church that I kind of grew up in. So I ended up going back to that church and served there as their youth and music pastor. Did the first eight years as their youth and music and then they switched me over to full-time music, and I stayed there for 27 years. Wow. So that's where I spent a lot of my career, 
And during that time is when I really started to write and compose a lot more because I found there were certain things I needed that uh, it was just hard to find what fit your group really well. You know, it's, it's there's so much great music written by wonderful composers and lots of music out there published. So you go, well, how can you not find something, you know, there? But, you know, we all have unique groups and unique talents and abilities. Um, so I really started to just write some things that I that I wanted to use within the church ministry there and then really started to develop that passion too to compose and arrange and write um so that kind of got me going down that path a little bit and for the most part i would say for the first uh 10 or 15 years of of the years that i was composing uh, i just mainly the people in beatrice nebraska heard it that was about it you know i just wrote it for the people there uh, my wife and i uh, started writing uh, musicals for christmas and um, a lot of churches, bigger churches, were doing musicals at Christmas and Easter time, but it would be kind of more focused on uh, the church choir kind of in their place, and then you'd add some drama to it. And what we found is we had a group of people that were really interested in doing more of a Broadway-type show and where we could do costumes and sets and lights, and it was more the music was integrated in like it would be for a, a regular book for a show on Broadway. So my wife and I actually started writing those together. Uh, she would do the dialogue and the script and I would write the music and the, and the lyric. We'd work together on it, develop these shows. Um, and that's where I think I really developed kind of my skill in my songwriting side of things, was just to kind of come up with those pieces that you got a nice flow out. It started from the beginning and it was all kind of connected and gave me a much better feel for that. Um, and at the time, you know, there just wasn't very, and still, there aren't very many shows like that available for churches that are doing those types of things. You could find a lot of cantatas and a lot of musicals with the church choir in the loft, but an actual musical uh, that's kind of geared towards the church audience. So that's kind of where we started to do that a little bit more. And then I think it was back in 2000, I want to say five or six, um, I started a choral festival at the church. Uh, that I was at and invited different people to come in. And the second year that we did it, Mark Hayes came up and spent some time there and did our choral festival. And he and I really connected. Uh, he really is the one that kind of mentored me on my music writing and composition skills and really uh, did a lot of great things for me. Uh, I kind of joke. A legend in the field, certainly. Yeah, and I was so fortunate that it just worked out that way. You know, it was one of those things where um, I guess I was never shy to ask somebody, you know, will you come do this for me? And Mark, uh, at, you know, and he still is in Kansas City. He and I still keep in contact. He's, I, he's just been great. He's been such an encourager to me. But uh, he's just in Kansas City there. So he's just a few hours, was a few hours away from me. And so it was super easy for him to come up and be part of that event for us. But uh, for that event, just as a way for me to give back to the choirs that came in, I would write a piece uh, to be on that choral festival. And so I asked Mark, are you okay doing one of my pieces? Because of course we wanna do all of his work if he's gonna be there. So he said, yeah, send me a couple things to look at. And it was really um, after that weekend, I started connecting with him and he said, hmm, would you like to see if we can get some of this stuff published? And uh, he said, I don't take too many students. Uh, but if you're interested, and so I, I spent a few weekends just going down to Kansas City and working through my music. Uh, I always tell people he's he is graciously honest. Uh, I never felt like he was uh, harsh about it at all, but I could always tell I would put a piece up and play through it, and, and I could always tell when I'd look at him and say, oh, you think I probably, I probably just need to throw this one away. And he would say something like, uh, yeah, I wouldn't spend a lot more time on it. You know, he was very gracious about it, uh, but he was great. And he was he was such a good mentor for me in the music side because he would look at the things that I w was writing and he would say, this will sound great if you're conducting or if your choir is singing it, but think about it. What if you've got an average church choir or an average choir singing it and an average piano player and an average conductor how can you write something that will sound excellent and amazing with that? And he said, and then you put this in front of professionals, it'll be even more spectacular. Uh, and it was just great advice because then I really started to learn how to kind of edit my stuff better um, and just understand the craft. 
for how many really years ago how too. many years ago was how do you he, write something? when you first started working with Marquez how many years ago was that um, I I think that was right in 2007 2008 mm. so I had spent you know 10 or 12 years writing before that before I got connected with him and um, you know who really got me started in college Boyd Bacon uh, is from Nebraska as well he was actually uh, my arranging professor at Westland in my undergrad years which was great. He was, I mean, I had a great start with him and everything. And he encouraged me early on to, you know, pursue that more. Um, but I just didn't with the time and, and, you know, who has time to do everything. <laughs> so it really wasn't until I got connected with Mark and I look back on it now and understand how important those first years were that I didn't have anything published, but I was, honing the craft. I was understanding it better. I could uh, just do it, I think, more proficiently, uh, um, you know, and having some life experience and going, yeah, this is really helps when it comes to composition. Because then when I did start to get things published, then it was pretty easy for me to, to really start to put some things out and, and get things out there. So um, it's just been a really interesting journey for me. You know, it's taken, I always thought, gosh, it's taken me 20 years before I really got to that point. But the age I'm at now, I feel like the next 20 years are probably going to be my most productive as a composer. Well, it's so, so. exciting. You, you you combine all that knowledge gained over a whole lifetime and you put that into your craft and, do, and it just keeps evolving as you evolve too. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. How many pieces have you had published up to date? Oh, I should know you were going to ask things like this, Jason. <laughs> um, I wish I could say that I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I I, I think I've broke the 50 mark or so. I mean, I think uh, I have a number of uh, anthems published, um, and then I have uh, four or five piano books that I've, that I've done over the years, too, um, ma mainly for Lorenz, and then uh, the Lilliness imprint Lorenz actually publishes. Um, so that's kind of through the Lorenz company, too, but... Uh, and I've really enjoyed the piano projects because, you know, that's that's a little bit different writing than writing for SATB choir. Um, and then I also conduct the Beatrice Regional Orchestra yet in Beatrice, which is a little ways from Omaha. But I've written a number of things then that we've used for the orchestra because, again, I seems like every group that I kind of get into, you know, it, it's not quite the traditional voicing that you would have. So, oh, we got to modify this or we need an arrangement of this that works with the instruments that we have. And that's kind of, from an instrumental standpoint, that's really what, what got me going. Uh, I will never forget, we were, um, I was going to a workshop about writing for like church orchestras and the clinician who was putting it on made the comment that if you don't have this number of strings and three trumpets and these winds, then you can't start a church orchestra. And I was at the time, Looking at my ministry going, I have uh, my wife who plays clarinet, I have a keyboard player and a piano, so I guess I'll just have to write for those three instruments. And, you know, as people came in, I never had traditional voicing. So it was like, how can I use these amazing people that God has dropped in my lap that have abilities, uh, you know, not leave them out of the mix here. And that's kind of where I started doing a lot of the instrumental side of things that I started writing. Yeah, so. working in the church, you have to be very flexible. I, I used to do a church <laughs> orchestra, and we, you know, we'd always have a, certain players there, and then certain would, and maybe they wouldn't be there that day, and you had to be very creative with the, right. the challenges you're faced. So, but it's using Absolutely. everyone's gift to the the best that they can be used, and that's our challenge as music directors and, and conductors, I guess, for any groups, but yeah. um, especially when you're in that church music ministry circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really did. And and I'm very grateful for that now because it really does, as a composer, it makes you kind of think about uh, the different instruments that you have and how can you get the different tone colors you want, how, you know, what's the best way to make this work if I've got a flute and a French horn and a trumpet, you know, and, and how can we still blend these? Or I have two string players and I've got a saxophone, you know, well, that's kind of an odd combination, but you know, that's the challenge then, you know, can we still make something beautiful out of that? Can we still allow these people, give them opportunity to use their abilities and their gifts? 
And that's the most important thing is finding ways for people to express themselves and to share that with the congregation. Uh, how do you find inspiration to write pieces? How do you, is it the text first? Do you write the text? How do you find that inspiration? You know, it, it's a little bit different, I think, every time that I do something. But I text is a big part for me when it comes to the, like the choral stuff that, you know, the SATV uh, music. I, I do enjoy arranging, too. So that's been kind of a, you know, that's a fun, different way of doing it. In fact, I most of the time, if I write something original, I'll just do just the basic melody and maybe some text and then go back and kind of treat it like I'm an arranger again so I can kind of play with it. But, but um there's lots of different things I think that uh, you use for inspiration for the instrumental side. That's a totally different thing, you know, because you don't have text to deal with there. Um, I know for me, I, and I think I mentioned it in one of the emails or things that we went back and forth prepping for this, you know, we talk a lot about sacred music and secular music. And I think for me, if I'm offering this as an offering to God at any point, it doesn't really matter if it's, I guess I don't like to make that distinction of sacred or secular music. It's just music and it's how we're using it. Now, of course, lyric, that makes a difference. You know, when you tie lyric to it, then of course it can be one thing or the other. But I know as an example, um, I would place just some soft piano music in my church service behind like a prayer time. And a lot of times it would be some arrangement of a hymn or some tune that people would recognize. And I had people come up and go, uh, that's a little distracting because I'm trying to focus on the prayer and then you bring this song into my head and all I can think about is that song. You know, I wish I like having the music just to kind of help set the mood. But, you know, if I get caught up in the lyric of the song, then I find myself not listening to the prayer and all of this. So I actually wrote a series of 12 pieces, piano pieces that were just called Intimate Moments. And it was just Intimate Moments, number one, number two, number three, all 12. And really the whole purpose of them was just to more set a mood or bring people into a quiet moment where they could reflect. And there was no lyric to it at all, of course, because it was just a piano and just instrumental. But I found that, you know, that becomes, can be a sacred moment for some people, but other people can use it just to relax or they might use it as background or something different. So it's just kind of interesting how that works. And for those, I think, I'm a fairly simple composer. That's been kind of one of my strengths. I used to be kind of frustrated with that because I would write something and go, well, it's nothing complicated. It's pretty simple. You know, the choir can learn it fast or I can play it pretty quickly. And I used to kind of criticize myself on that side of things saying, oh, well, you know, these, you, could, you look at these great big, huge works that these people have done and go, wow, I, do, I don't write things like that. You know, the things I write seem pretty simple. And I think it was Larry Shackley at Lorenz when I was working with him on one of my piano books. And he said, you should not be critical of that. You should be, you should look at that as a gift. He said, there's very few people that can write simple and yet beautiful music that really works and isn't dumbed down. And it still can be, you know, something very musical. So I kind of have embraced that over the years and said, well, this is just who I am as a composer. You know, I, you're, I'm not going to be complicated. I'm not going to be complex. I'm pretty straightforward. And I think that's kind of how I live my life, too. You know, what you see is what you get. So that nexus of faith and that nexus of art is a, a special thing. And, and bringing music to a broad audience is, is really a gift. And, um, um, and how many pieces have you written um, recently? Have you found a lot of time to be composing? Have you found a lot of time to write? Yeah, that has been a challenge for me because in just the last few years here, um, I switched positions. I was, I'm was i no longer at the church that I was at in Beatrice for 27 years. I moved on and I actually um, was hired on as the fine arts manager at a croc center uh, that's in Omaha, Nebraska. And there are actually 20, uh, 27, six crocs across the country. Uh, we're part of the Salvation Army. So these croc centers are set up in uh, the lower income neighborhoods in, in a bigger city. And in Omaha, we're in, in the South, on Omaha South. Um, but they're set there just to really serve that community. And I was very fortunate as part of a grant uh, from the territory headquarters of the Salvation Army in Chicago to uh, really develop a whole fine arts program for them. And so I was able to come into that position. And, and I've been there for just a little over three years. 
And this past January now, I've moved into a different position there as their arts and education director. So I oversee more of the departments in the center, but I'm still mainly the fine arts manager. I still run the fine arts department. So moving into that new position, it was just such a different thing. And, and of course, starting a fine arts program that was nothing, that really had nothing going and we're building this, a lot of my time and energy was spent there. But believe it or not, with COVID, this has given me more time to get back and write. Um, things have not slowed down at the Croc Center and it's always gonna be that way. It's always gonna be nuts. But um, you know, it has given me a chance to just kind of, I have a virtual uh, choir that I kind of started. Uh, so I'm doing some arrangement, arranging for that group. Uh, you know, I still, our regional orchestra is doing small group things, but we're doing virtual there too. So it's given me opportunity to do some reading, writing there. And then the other area that I've been delving into just the last couple of years here is we, I started a youth choir at uh, the Croc Center for the elementary age kids. And so I've been writing some youth music for that particular choir, some two part things, some simple things that we could learn there. So uh, it's been really good. I, it feels good to me when I can get back and, and write again. Uh, it sounds like this position is like, it just takes all that you learned in your previous jobs, puts it at that, that next level and gives you more challenges and you get to bring your, your unique compositional gifts to that organization as well. That's great. Yeah, it's been really great. And I think what appealed to me about moving into this new position at the Croc Center is that um, I felt to a certain extent, I kind of moved out of just the church walls. Not that that's a bad place to be because that was an amazing ministry and amazing opportunity for me to use those gifts. But this is more of a community based uh, where I can still express my faith. That's still a major part of what I do because we're part of the Salvation Army. But at the same time, we're we're not limited to just maybe what you would do in a church. It opens up a whole area of you know music education and music composition and all kinds of different things. You know, electronic. We've done things with GarageBand with kids and showing them how to use that, and um, it just really allows people to be creative. and And there's so many opportunities like that now. It's so great that the Croc Centers exist in all these major cities and give give the kids some hope in this this very challenging mm -hmm. time. How many how many uh, how many people do you serve, and how big are the the age? Um, what's the age range? Well, the age range of uh, the the center itself, um, if for lack of a better way of explaining it, I mean it's really kind of like a. a YMCA on steroids. I mean, we uh, there's a lot. Uh, the Croc Center started in California, in San Diego, and Joan Croc, who her husband was Ray Croc of McDonald's fame. She's really the one, it's really her brainchild. She wow. wanted to provide uh, a center where people could be developed uh, from a spiritual standpoint, physical, artistic, and her being a musician herself, the fine arts was important to her. I did not know uh, that. So, what was her What was her yeah, musical um, background? She, she was. Uh, she played piano as a vocalist, and, oh. and so it's really. I mean, it was near and dear to her heart, which is part of the reason why these grants came up to really boost what was going on in the fine arts departments in these croc centers because they were feeling like, yeah, we haven't done enough there. You know, Joan would want more with that. So um, it's kind of amazing because within the center then we have uh, a small water park, it's indoor, so there's a slide to it, you know, so we've got a whole aquatics uh, center. We've got two gymnasiums and an indoor soccer turf, a state-of-the-art fitness center. We've got a performing arts center, a whole education wing where we're doing day camps and summer camps and after-school programming, a loft area for kids to hang in. I've got a piano lab up there so I can teach piano. Uh, we've got drums to do drums and drum circles. Uh, you know, it's just this amazing center, even an indoor big playground area. Um, and I, we, of course, with COVID has, has affected our membership, but we generally have around three to 4,000 people that are members of the Croc Center. Uh, and then we have church on Sunday morning because it's the Salvation Army, but we really look at the Croc Center as uh, the whole, all of our members. We, we try to serve them and be there for them, support them, be there spiritually, be there, you know, every way that we can for the people that are part of our center and for the, the community in South Omaha. So it's an amazing facility and, and great opportunities that we haven't even tapped into what, what we're capable of doing yet.
The Salvation Army has always had such a strong connection to music. Um, the, the Northeast Territorial Headquarters is right around the corner from my house, actually. Here, I live in Rockland mm-hmm. County, and I know the, the staff band practices there, and I'm familiar with them because yeah. they've come to Ocean Grove a few times, and I've gotten to watch. I knew some of the players in there from the professional uh, orchestral scene, and I'm sitting there like, yeah. whoa, I know some of those people. They're fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they're, that, that's some wonderful ensembles associated with the Salvation Army. Yeah, and you know, brass band, I think most people think of brass band when it comes to Salvation Army. And what's interesting with the Crocs is that sometimes, you know, we're focusing, we're doing other things besides brass band. And it, it was really interesting to me about a, about a year or two ago, um, I had the opportunity to go and be part of their composer uh, forum that they had in Chicago. And so basically, some of our music was reviewed by some of the composers of well-known composers of the Salvation Army that have been part of the Salvation Army for years. And um, they don't do as much with choral music as they do, of course, brass band. Nobody does think brass band's better than the Salvation Army. I mean, they know how to do that. Choral music is, I had some of my pieces there and it was kind of interesting. I was working, I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head, but he's one of their older composers. He's like 80 years old. And he was looking at some of my music music and uh the choral music and i said something about well it's not it's not band music it's choral and he goes well that's okay it doesn't have to be and we had this really cool discussion about how the salvation army has it's about brass bands but it's more about the how they've been innovative in their career you know the reason they started the brass bands was to reach people and to bring people in and he said we're in 2019 or whatever year it was. And he said, we still have to be innovative and maybe the brass band isn't always the innovative way to bring people in. But Salvation Army has not, has been more about innovation than it has been about just brass bands. And it was, it was really encouraging. So I, yeah, and I've had opportunities. One of the things I'm gonna be doing soon now, we're just getting started is doing some uh, croc virtual choirs, youth mm-hmm. choir and adult choirs with six of the crocs that are in the central territory. So, um, you know, that's an opportunity to kind of bring the, the Crocs together in a, in a way that we haven't done yet. That's exciting um, to bring all again, these various cities together and all this talent. There must be so much talent when you pool. That, that's an exciting uh, chance to really expand. Yeah, I think it's going to give us some really cool opportunities. And those types of things I don't see going away. And I think that's where, you know, I was talking to my little orchestra at some point this when we got started this fall and we started working in just small groups and we talked about the virtual orchestra. And I said something, you know, it, it took me a while and through all this, probably till about April or May uh, of this whole COVID thing where I finally decided to get off my pity pot and go, OK, I can either sit here and bemoan how horrible it is. I don't get to do the music the way I want to. I wish I had more. You know, I wish I could go back and conduct a group. And I wish we could be singing in choirs again. And I thought, well, either I can sit here and just be sad about that and just wallow in that. Or we can move forward and figure out how are we going to do something that allows us to have that outlet. And so doing the virtual choir and doing some of these virtual groups, I think, it's not the same, but it does give us an outlet and it gives us a way to continue to communicate. And it maintains our sense of community. I think that's one of the most yeah. important things for especially community groups is feeling that the connection that we get in rehearsals. Is it, we do a lot, I do a lot of Zoom rehearsals, chance to you know get together and work on the music, and it's not the same, of course, but it does give us a chance to um, to come together to to make the music to uh, to for individuals to work on their parts to have focus to give focus to their practice, and I think that's mm-hmm. just as important as the actual performance and more important because it's the process always that that dictates how successful the final product is yeah and what i found that's really interesting and and i don't know i i'm probably not the first one to think it through this way but with the virtual groups i know it's a really a challenge for some of those people who don't feel comfortable singing alone or playing their instrument alone they want to be in the group they want to hear the other instruments they depend on the other instruments but i've looked at it and we've talked about this in my orchestra and i said but if you can get comfortable doing this you know listening to the track and be able to play along and play as a soloist and use this time to really hone your skills and feel really comfortable with that imagine how much stronger our groups are going to be when we're able to be back in person 
Yeah, I've told, we're, or we're doing I've had this together. exact conversation with my university choirs and my community mm -hmm. choral societies. I have, I have two universities and choruses and an orchestra and then two choral societies. And I said, my goal is that when we come out of this, you will be a better musician because of the mm -hmm. work you're putting in. And a lot that we yeah, I've, I have a lot of people. There's a lot of concern about I'm not a soloist. I'm a choral voice. I don't feel comfortable recording. And then everyone's got to get used to hearing themselves on a recording. I know it's a challenge because my staff at Ocean Grove said the same thing. You know, this took me an hour to send in the anthem for this Sunday because I didn't like the way I sounded on the F sharp, you know, because musicians yeah. being professionals, we, we love, we were very careful. And, but it's a, once you get over that, of those hurdles, it gets easier each time you do it as well. It does. And I believe just, I think I probably said those same things to you, Jason, when I emailed you my tapes, my tracks for the Ocean Grove Choral Festival, you know, and I, I it was great for me to go on that side of it and, and experience, you know, make sure I know what my putting my singers through and my players through. But, you know, I, I went through all five songs and then I'm loading them up and then I'm going, oh, man, you know, there's a couple times on there. That's I don't know that it's really that great, you know, so it but it is it's a good challenge. You know, even my my concert master and my orchestra you know, she had said, it took me five times, you know, to this yeah. because I listened to myself and she wasn't, and I said, I know, but you don't understand that even though it might not be perfect for what you're doing as an individual, once we put that together and we edit that, it, it fixes it. It's just like a live performance then, you know, so that, that said, stagger together. breathe. Don't worry about stagger breathing. Don't worry about those things. Right. It all comes together in the end. Yeah. <laughs> But I also assure my my musicians that if there's a really good clunker in there, that's pretty bad. I can also edit that out. That's something a little different that I can't do in a live performance. So we don't have that. We don't have that. We don't have the kill button in a <laughs> no. bring down this, them back up again. Yeah, that doesn't exist yeah, in live yeah. performance. <laughs> Not at all. So. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel any better, I had a uh, I had a um, a violinist from the Met Orchestra and his wife, and we were talking about the same thing. And he's doing virtual projects, and we're all in this boat together. The entire musical community is working, and we're starting to see performances open up. I, I, I told you before, my friend from Jacksonville, uh, Jim Neglias, they're actually performing a whole season down in Jacksonville with social distance protocols, very carefully um, with masks and with, with cages, like those uh, acrylic cages. I mean, it's a yeah. real, they, they spent a very long time working on the protocols, but um, we're starting to see some performances happen. It's very slow. Europe more than here. China's opened up entirely, they told us on my, on my show. Wow. I mean, so we're yeah. starting to see some movement in the musical world, but we have to be careful. I mean, yeah, that's the reality. Yeah, we absolutely do. Yeah, and I, you know, even with just the community groups, I think, uh, you know, people are wanting to be part of that, you know, talking to just some of my musicians in the orchestra. Uh, when we talked as a board in August, trying to decide what our season is going to look like, because one of the things that we lost there uh, was a rehearsal space. You know, the school, we couldn't go into the school. We didn't have a performance space. So we talked about doing some small groups, you know, brass quintet, woodwind trios, string quartet, putting some things together. And I said, we, we surveyed the whole, all of our musicians. What are you comfortable doing? You know, are you comfortable coming in? And a lot of people were like, yeah, if we social distance and we can come in, we want to come in because I got to be playing music again. I just can't do this. And, and I can't wait, you know, to another six months or a year before I can do it again. So yeah, I think finding ways to do it is extremely important. I had my so. first live choral rehearsal last weekend, and I've got another one this weekend. And there was a subset of my group, the Taconic Chorale, up in Westchester. And we sat we sat in someone's backyard. They put the keyboard with an extension cord through the house on the deck, and I'm I'm far away, <laughs> and they're spaced out at least ten feet each or something like that with masks on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a different uh, experience, but. Uh, <laughs> But people Very were, different. We were so <laughs> joyful just to be in the same room, just to be in the yeah. same space. Yeah. You have yeah. to listen and very differently just, outside. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think just making those connections, I think, is important, too, because I think that's all part of it. That's always been part of, especially community groups and choral groups and instrumental groups, is just the camaraderie and being able to get together. You know, composers, we can we can sit down in our basements and write our music and be pretty pretty content sometimes. But uh, to get the performances out, yeah, you want that community there. So, Kevin, what are some of the things you think are going to be different in in the composition community and the music community after this COVID crisis dies down? Why do you think this is going to change our industry? 
You know, I think I think it's probably going to affect the publishing side of things. You know, we were I feel like we were kind of on the verge of that already with, you know, the with the possibility of doing digital downloads and all, you know, that was kind of pushing the traditional form of publishing music, you know, into another realm. Um, I think this is going to do that even more um, because it's it's just easier to access things, you know, and have it at your fingertips. Um, I think as a composer, what's kind of interesting to me is uh, since I've been doing some arranging for like the virtual choir and thinking for, along those lines and the virtual youth choir things, I think you think a little bit differently on how you put things together because you start thinking about how can I write something that really will work well as a virtual piece as opposed to something, you know, in in person. And I don't think it means that everything, you know, that we set the tempo and it never changes, you know, so that everybody can, can sync in together. I think there still can be variants in there, but it's obviously a lot more difficult to have lots of rubato and a lot of tempo changes and time changes in, in things if you're going to try and produce them virtually. Um, so I think that could be a possibility because I think, you know, people are going to look for music that they know can work well as a virtual piece. Uh, with having players in different places and bringing them together. So I think that's going to have a little bit of an impact too. And then performances, I think it's going to have a big you know, impact. I've, I've been kind of joking with people around here saying, I don't know, I think if I was a Broadway producer, um, I would try and figure out a way to mount a show where I could make money with half the ticket sales. Yeah, and I think, then I think I, I've, I've got a couple. You know, of, I've got two Broadway artists coming on this show um, in the next couple months. One is a, a was a one of the lead cast members of the Blue Man Group, who's been on that show for twenty years, I believe, and another couple artists. And I don't think Broadway is going to come back for a long time because it's built on selling as many tickets and stuffing people in as close as possible to make it's a, it's entertainment. It's not um, it's not like the Metropolitan Opera even or the Symphony. It's going to be it's a different mm -hmm. model entirely. So I think we're going to have to. It's going to take a long time for that to come back that producers will take the risk of trying that yeah i think we're gonna have i think that industry in particular is really gonna have to think about how to make that comeback happen because you know broadway's that way if you think about the concert venues with the big uh you know things that happen in the arenas they're in that same boat i think we're you know you got to sell out you got to sell all of the tickets in order to you know make money on that well how can we then put performances of excellence and really great entertaining performances together on half the budget. If you, if they could figure out a way to do that, then, then they'll be better off in the long run because then once we can't open back up to full capacity, they're looking at 50% profit. You know, I mean, there's, there's a difference there. Do you, you think know? it takes so, some notes from the uh, university, from the church music, uh, whose budgets are always low. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Put together something that you you know, you've got no budget for. And then whatever you make is going to be gravy. But, uh, you know, I don't I don't uh, I don't pretend to understand how that would all work. And I am glad that is not the industry that I'm in. Um, as a composer, it's, it's been kind of interesting to just connect with some of my my friends that are also composers and editors and with uh, the companies that I have things published with realizing that, oh, it could very easily be another year or two before anything new comes out from me just because of how, you know, their their publishing schedule has now changed. They're not releasing anything new. You know, they're kind of on hold for a little bit here too. So um, yeah, it just trickles down to everybody. There's, you know, nobody is walks away from this unscathed as a musician. How many pieces do you have in the, in the queue ready to be published that you've got uh, in that stack of music you finished ready to go? Oh. In that stack of music, there's this is the interesting thing. As as a person who is a freelance, you know, I'm not under contract with any one particular uh, publishing company. So anytime that I usually do a, a round of submissions, I can submit anywhere from 15 to 20 pieces, uh, you know, to several different yeah to several different publishing companies. And I always feel like if if I get two accepted for a publication, that's a great year. I mean, that's 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 been really good. Um, I can remember early on in this, uh, one of the very first pieces that I ever got published, and I think it's it's the arrangement we're going to listen to at the close of this sh uh, the show today, uh, the arrangement of I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Um, I wrote that for, actually, my sister uh, has a youth choir in 
uh, Lincoln at a, at a church in Lincoln, and that's what that that originally was written for. And then it was one of those that went through a kind of a morphing with Mark Hayes. He kind of worked through it with me on on it, and he said this would be a great one to send to Lorenz. And he said, but I'm not going to guarantee any publication on it because he said, how many more arrangements do we really need if I have decided to follow Jesus? I mean, there's probably a hundred of them out there. But amazingly enough, that was the one of the that was the very first piece that Lorenz picked up of mine and published. And so it really there's. I'll hopefully share another little bit of that story, but it really has become significant to me, that particular arrangement. But, uh, you know, that piece was published that year. And then the following spring, I think to Lorenz, I submitted like six or seven anthems. And Lloyd Larson was my editor there on my choral stuff. And he wrote me, emailed me back when they got him. And he said, now, I want to preface this by saying, this is not going to happen every time you send us something. And this happens very rarely, but they took like five of my pieces at one shot. You know, wow. and normally it's just, it was just like one at a time. And he said, I'm just prefacing this. I don't want you because you're, you're just getting started in this. I don't want you to think every time you send it, you know, things are going to get published. But I think uh, a lot of us that are freelance that are doing that kind of thing, that's kind of what we have. We have a number of pieces that are in the queue. We, you know, have different times of the year that we know to send out to the different editors for them to look over the material. And we just hope that it fits in their, in one of their categories and fills a need that they have. Um, you know, they have tons of music that comes in freelance, you know, so they have very few spots open besides the, the places that they have open for their, their composers that they published on a regular basis. Well, it's so, so important it's, that, uh, um, yeah, there's a, I'm glad you did submit that to be that, that the arrangement of the famous hymn, because you know that there's always uh, every, like when we think that, uh, that we think of a piece that's very famous, like, um, Oh, like the battle hymn of the Republic, the Wilhowski. Well, there's, mm -hmm. there was a, there was a famous version before that and that, that supplanted <laughs> it. So there, I think that's always yeah. the case in the church that we're always reinventing or uh, finding a new voice to go alongside with these great hymns. And I think it, it always keeps, keeps it fresh. Yeah. And that, you know, that piece really has become, that was a very important piece for me. Um, I did the arrangement originally for that youth choir, but then Mark and I worked through it. And then it was the first piece of mine that was published, but it also uh, kind of launched me into some other things that I got to do. Um, uh, Chris uh, Monroe, who is a min music minister in Vinton, uh, North Carolina, I think it's North Carolina, at Vinton Baptist, did it with his choir, and then he was looking for somebody to uh, write a commission piece for him for the retirement of his organist, and so he contacted me, and I realized that was the piece that he had done of mine, and then through that connection with him, I actually ended up going over to India to teach for about three weeks at a Christian college in India uh, one summer, and I Have Decided to Follow Jesus is actually an Indian song, that's where it came from, was wow. India, which the story behind the, the piece, um, and I just had to look it up quick so that I didn't misspeak or, or say the wrong thing uh, tonight, but the, the story of that piece is that uh, the gentleman who wrote that piece uh, in the mid-1800s over in India was persecuted, was martyred, uh, oh. and it was his entire family, so he yeah. had two children and his wife, and the the people that were martyring him had his two children there and they said to him, you know, either denounce Christ or we're going to kill your kids. And he started singing, I have decided to follow Jesus. They killed his children. They said, denounce Christ or we're going to kill your wife. And he started singing uh, the verse of though none go with me, still I will follow. They killed his wife. And then they were going to threaten him, and he sang the cross before me, the world behind me, and they martyred him. So it's just, it, it's just an amazing, you know, we sing this little, this little hymn, little chorus, and don't realize the story behind all of that. And it was originated in India, and then I, it was just very interesting 
for me to feel like I was going back to India and I was going to be teaching there. And so there's so many little connections of that piece. And it's always been one that I've just loved. Even as a kid growing up, I can remember singing that you know, around the campfire. So it's always amazing uh, when we dig into really the, the development of this hymnody, the pieces that we know and how yeah. incredibly important they are. The, 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 these stories are the, I didn't know that, that particular story, mm-hmm. but that's amazing. And that's yeah. uh, makes it so much yeah. more profound when you tell the story and people engage with how, how incredibly profound these pieces can be. Yeah. You know, and, and I, maybe the reason I, uh, that, that appeals to me so much is what I was talking about before. You know, I don't feel like I, I don't, I've never written Handel's Messiah or something, you know, so complex that you dig into all of these things. And I have decided to follow Jesus is probably about one of the more simple kind of hymn chorus things that we have, you know? And so it, it just really seems to fit me as a composer and what I've tried to do over the years and kind of grown into that, you know, the straightforward, simply some, something that's simple and something that's beautiful. So we have our first question from the audience. This is from Anna from Great. Detroit. Anna asks, um, let's, what, let me the question here in front of me. Yeah. She asks, um, uh, what advice do you have for a young composer just starting out in the business today? Oh, wow. That is a really good one because it is a really tough, it's even tougher now, I think, than when, you know, I started writing 20 years ago. Um, I would say find some places where you can write some things that you can get in front of real life bodies and musicians and get some of your stuff performed, whether it's with your your local church choir or a community group or even maybe the high school or someplace so that you can see how your pieces actually work if, if you haven't had a chance to do that yet with some, some real musicians. Um, but I would not discourage anybody. I would say just to really work at your craft. There's all kinds of things you can uh, even do on YouTube anymore, you know, that will give some good. And of course, you have to sift through some of this because sometimes it's not the best instruction in the world, but it will give you some ideas. And really, when it comes to composition, knowing good basic theory is extremely important when you're writing. But there's a whole realm of just being able to try new things or take a risk and do something maybe that hasn't been done before. Um, And then network, 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 you know, as much as you can. Uh, For me, I did an awful lot of writing until I finally made that connection with Mark Hayes. And then from there is kind of where I was able then to connect with other people, you know, you just don't know where those connections are going to lead. But um, not that the music publishing companies don't publish uh, totally freelance and people that sub- submit something, but it's getting to the point now where a lot of those bigger companies aren't even accepting uh, submissions from uh, unsolicited submissions like what they used to. You know, you used to be able to send your manuscript in to almost any company. And um, I'd say there's a, not too many of them that do that anymore. You know, it's usually through a connection of somebody or you have something published with them before. Um, you know, I, I have worked with a few uh, people that uh, have not been published yet, but they'll make the connection with me and we'll work on a piece and do that as a collaborative effort. You know, I have a, a friend of mine that actually Mark Hay sent my way uh, that's a minister of music in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we have two or three pieces now. He's written the music and the the lyric and the, the melody, and then I go back and do the SATB arrangement of it. So we've had some pieces done that way. Ron Cadmus, who's a uh, friend of both of us, great. Shout out to man. Pastor Ron um, Cadmus, a shout out. Yes, Ron Cadmus, Cadmus a shout out to him. Uh, interesting way that we can, and this gives... Um, I hope I'm not getting off topic, but this gives you an idea of how to network a little bit. Um, And keep in mind that here I am in the middle of Nebraska, in the middle of the country, not in a heavy populated area. I'm not in Nashville or in LA or in New York City or anything like that. And uh, Ron Cadmus actually heard one of my little piano pieces played. um, It was, and it was part of the church music church pianist magazine that Lorenz puts out so he was uh filling in pulpit filling for a church in new york someplace the organist played this little piano piece he found me on facebook wrote me a message and said i love this little piece of you would you ever consider putting lyric to it and i said well sure you know so well he sent me lyric that he had written 
And uh, we submitted that to Lorenz, you know, since Lorenz was the one that published the piano and they didn't accept it. They didn't publish it. But it started the path of this collaboration now with Ron. And I feel like he's he's been a great encouragement to me. He's the way I got connected with you was through Ron. Um, yes, he, but he, he he championed your work to me. And he, he, say, he sat me down and said, you have to listen to some works by this person. And he found some of the YouTube clips of the choir singing your music. And I'm like, I'm like, this is just great stuff. And then and then you brought that uh, in his steps to Ocean Grove. And that was, there's, we still talk about that. And that, that, that video came out. <laughs> the joy you show in that video is just so typical of, your, of you and your work. And that energy is oh. just so infectious. Well, thanks. Yeah, and, and he's... You know, it's been great. He and I have done several pieces together, and, and we one published with Hinshaw uh, Press that uh, we did together. And it was one of those things. I that's always been an interesting story for me to share because I always look at that and go, okay, so Ron, who, I mean, oh my word, the people that he knows, you know, and the the experiences that he's had. You know, he was the associate pastor for Norman Vincent Beale at at the church, you know, in New York. Normal collegiate. I yep. mean, <laughs> yeah, and he's he's met, you know, presidents, he's met uh, Maria Von Trapp from The Sound of Music. I mean, uh, she's met everybody you can think of. He's had this amazing life, and he li lives in New York City, you know, um, and when we were talking, I was telling him, oh, yeah, I live in Beatrice, Nebraska, and he's like, well, how many people live in Beatrice? I said, 12,000, and he goes, oh, there's 12,000 people in my block. It is building. Know, so we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's very vast differences between us, but yet we came together, we got connected through Facebook and through internet and through one little piano piece. So you just never know. I think the big, the best piece of advice I can give to anybody is, is to do what you can to get your stuff out there. You know, whether, and now with YouTube, and I know there's a lot of stuff out there, so it takes a lot to get, you know, for people to find you there. But you have more opportunity to do things like that, and you just never know where those connecting points are going to happen. Yeah, um, I tell my students always be a good colleague, and I'll be out there advocating and meeting people and shaking hands, and and you have to be diligent and you have to be hardworking, but be ready. And honestly, um, if you want to make a living at it, or if you're you're hoping that you're going to make a lot of money at being a, com a composer, um, that probably won't happen you know, just realistically. But if you if you love composing, you love writing music, then, you know, get to a point where that's enough for you, you know, to really just write things. And, and if it's good enough, you know, you get satisfaction from that, that's fantastic. Because uh, it's a it's like anything in the music world, it's really tough to, to make a living at it. Uh, so just really be thrilled with what you are able to do and take opportunities for i mean there's co the small communities all over that are looking for things like that so is finding a place to apply your gifts and like like you're such a great model for this how you you you, you started in the church writing for certain specific organizations and um and circumstances and then you broadened out your your as you developed your career you broadened out and now you're writing mm -hmm. music that literally covers thousands of people so it's uh it's yeah. a wonderful progression yeah, it, and it's it's humbling. I mean, I of course, there's a lot of composers that, you know, have way, do way more things or have their music out there a lot more. But I know for me, uh, one of the, the times that was kind of uh, a moment of epiphany for me that was really interesting, um, Lorenz has a sister company in Korea. Mm -hmm. And so um, they put out some of the music that they publish here, they translate into Korean, and then they put it out in a book for choirs over there to use and I will never forget what I got in the mail this thick book uh, of SATB anthems that Lorenz the sister company in Korea had published with the CD and I have decided to follow Jesus was one of them I think I had two in there but I have decided to follow Jesus was one of them in there and so I had a recording of them singing in Korean this piece and going oh this is this is on the other side of the world it's just amazing and then if I, I got onto YouTube and, you know, just put in a couple of my pieces and found that I have a Christmas tune called um, A Silent Night Brings New Light, which has been a, has been a, a pretty popular uh, piece. And, you know, I can get on YouTube and see Korean choirs singing that in Korean, you know, and it's just it's it's pretty humbling and kind of amazing to think that, wow, you know, this is something I wrote. And it's interesting, you know, Silent Night Brings New Light. 
I actually wrote in the month of May, but I was in, I can remember this so well, I was in um, Estes Park, Colorado. My wife had gone to a writer's conference there and she was going to the conference and I went with her for the weekend just to take the time to do some writing. And it was May, mid-May, so it should have been really nice weather, but for some reason it was snowing that day. So oh, I, here it is mid-May, I'm in Estes Park, Colorado, sitting in this cabin watching the snow outside, and I wrote a Christmas. That kind of was the inspiration to write a Christmas to. Um, and it was it was a piece that I really, I was okay with. I wasn't super excited about it. And it was, again, one of those pieces that I kind of worked through with Mark. And uh, I think the comment when he heard it the first time, he's like, this is really nice, but it's kind of stock. And I was like, it's stock. And he said, yeah, you're more creative than that. You can do better on this. And so I went back that night and changed and fixed some things, came back with him again. And eventually we got it to a place where I, it's one of my favorite pieces. But uh, I think you just continually work at your craft. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's, it's great to catch up with you. It's been too many years and we'll get together soon, I'm sure. I'll bring you back. Uh, love to have you back on the East Coast again and uh, catch up with you I'd and your family. I'd love to come back. That'd Continued success in your work and um, keep making music and uh, changing lives. Yes, thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity tonight. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Music Matters 2020. It's been such a pleasure to have you here tonight. Please remember to subscribe and help our channel grow. Um, we are one of the large, we are the, one of the fastest growing uh, musical communities on Facebook, especially podcasts. And we're delighted that you can be a part of this community. Uh, please share this video and help us to grow. And uh, remember, keep music alive. Good night.